Okay, hello and welcome to uh, our Amplify look ahead to uh, 2019. I've joined here by two special guests. Uh, forget this guy. We've got this lady. So Teresa's joined us. Thank you, Teresa, for taking the time out to come from Brussels. I know it's been an incredibly stressful year, but we really admire you doing everything you can. And, and thank you for giving up half an hour of your time for joining us. Uh, and then the other person sat here, of course, is Piers, our head of trading, uh, who you know very well. Um, and basically, I'm going to lead a discussion of getting his thoughts, and I'll add some of my own, of what we think um, 2019 has got in store. Starting off with, I guess, uh, a bit of a talk through of what exactly is it that's happened this year. So if I just quickly transition my charts to this graphic and I guess we've got to kick things off Piers with talking about um, the renewed or the comeback of the VIX renewed volatility uh, which is such a contrast to when we were having this discussion 2017 yeah it was the one of the exact most dull times. points of uh, markets one dimensional kind of equity rise record lows in the VIX and, and now here we are um, to change. So I guess at 89% at relative performance here to date, what do you think? Do we go, how much further do we go? Do we pull back from that in the next coming months? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think definitely this year, and you can see that also, I mean, obviously the VIX is looking at the, it's kind of a measure of volatility um, when you look at the S&P 500. And I think that I'm just going to transition back to just the long-term S&P chart, and um, you know it's quite clear. 2017 was a year where stocks just went up and up and up and up and up and up, uh, record ever low volatility year. And I think the big contrast between this year and last year is definitely that volatility is back in style and go back to that chart, you can see the VIX top of the list here, 89% higher, and that's because, yeah, volatility is back. And I, and I guess for, for, depends who you are in these markets, it depends how you operate, whether you're long-term, short-term, whether you're long-only. Um, I think for us, short-term, um, where we can go long or short, you know, these kind of volatility conditions are absolutely ideal. You know, 2017 was was a slow old year, and I think a, a breath of fresh air into short-term trading this year. And the, and the thing looking into 2019 is that yes, 89% up on the VIX, but go back to the S&P chart. You know, this this violence that we've seen this year in this index, um, I think, is definitely set to continue as we hit. 2019. So, you know, from our point of view, um, short-term trading, um, I think that these conditions are very healthy and <clears throat> are here to stay. I think if you're a long-term investor, quite the opposite. You know, I think we're at, at that kind of major. You, you, these long-term investors have not had a stronger test of their um, their, their confidence. Uh, in a decade now, I think you know. Ultimately, we've been in a, in a decade of buy the dip. Anytime stocks drop, it's get long because then we're going to go to new highs yet again. And of course, going back over the years, that's been a lot to do with the, you know, the monetary policy in this world, the stimulus from the central banks that have been that safety net. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Fed stopped stimulating back in 2014. But of course, three months after the Fed ended QE. Uh, the ECB started QE and so you know the baton was passed on and we've had you know central banks propping up this asset class for a decade it's just that when we hit 2019 and you're already seeing that now of course the, the volatility here this year for many reasons but one of them underlying it all I think is that central banks have now stepped back um, and obviously the ECB are ending their QE program in a few weeks time and then you've got the two central banks, well, firstly, the Fed hiking, 
and now the ECB stopping their stimulus and I think this is will continue to contribute to you know volatility remaining elevated as we as we go into the start of next year and and through next year probably so then on the, on that point then I saw about a week ago a lot of the big banks putting forward their S&P year-end forecasts and we know that that's obviously <coughs> incredibly difficult to be accurate with but most are looking for a return back to near the top of where we were at the all-time highs on average basis so yeah. if we are then withdrawing the stimulus the Fed to kind of uh, are on track if you like obviously a big decision next week could the FMC about where do we go with the rate sequence from thereafter um, the December hike but if the ECB are finishing let's say is there what would be the alternate argument then i.e. if trade war got worse and the slowdown we've seen evident in data in Europe um, continues we have a hard Brexit or no deal let's just put a, a real negative spin worst yeah. case where does this what happens right. to the S&P as an initial reaction but then ultimately the mechanism of monetary policy coming back in yeah. how quickly would they act what would they do and then Right. So yeah, you're thinking be? worse. I mean, I, I mean, I, I know big banks are perhaps thinking, you know, <coughs> back towards the the, the the top here. You know, we never quite made it to the three thousand mark, of course, and I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think at the start of this year, sorry, at the end of last year, I, I think I said in the in this this kind of preview that we did twelve months ago for 2018, I said that stocks would have a negative year and. For a lot of this year, that call was looking fantastically incorrect, but um, here we are with just a few weeks to go, and the S&P, well, go back to that chart here, actually. It takes a while to find it, but the s and is basically in the middle. The S&P right now is down minus 1.89% on the year, which, I don't know, in some ways is surprising, given that we've had a lot of chaos and carnage and a lot of downside on stocks of late. It's actually only put the S&P back to pretty much where it started. Um, but I think I, I cannot see uh, the scenario where the S&P gets back to the top next year. I think this year has been marginally negative, And I think next year it can be positive for stocks, but not, not back to the 2018 high. But of course, it could be, as you were saying, with some of these um, negative stories, you know, very much still in the uh, you know, it's unknown how these are going to transpire, then, yeah, we certainly could get another negative year. And there's no reason why the S&P can't track, you know, back down towards 2000. I mean, you've got, it would take a, the, the kind of perfect storm um, where obviously the big risks uh, ahead are the trade war risk. So that's the US and, and, and China. And how does that evolve and develop? And the, I'd say one of the big dates in your diaries for 2019 is the 1st of April. Um, but we'll know before then. But the 1st of April is Donald Trump's. Uh, that's where he's moved the date um, whereby he's threatened to raise Chinese tariffs from 10% to 25% on $200 billion worth of goods. I think that's a massive line in the sand for you next year and we've got three and a half months for the two biggest economies on the planet to, to come to some form of arrangement you've actually seen this morning what i find quite interesting just over the last week or so or since that g20 summit is um you've seen quite a few negatives occur from the us's side or well let's take the arrest of the uh, the daughter of the ceo of Huawei in Canada, um, I thought that was a pretty uh, aggressive move from, let's say, the North American side. Um, you know, ratcheting up the ante, um, quite uh, yeah, an aggressive move. And it's quite interesting. I think this morning, the response really, China have now lowered tariffs on U.S. automotives. Now, that's a, that's a concession on China. I think up until now, what's happened is Trump's been threatening and threatening and threatening. And China's been saying, look, we don't deal like that. We can't come to the negotiating table if you're just going to be threatening and bullying. So, you know, we're not interested. Um, I think maybe you've just seen a slight change in China's um, strategy on how this all works. And that is one of the reasons for that in the end is this graphic showing you 
what's happening economically now in China. I think in the end, you've got Trump on one side, you've got Xi Jinping on the other side, and they can they can strut their stuff, they can they can threaten. Um, you know, it's all part of that negotiating process. However, in the end, Xi Jinping is a. In the end, his actions will be driven by the economic conditions. And if economic conditions deteriorate, and the data set that we had overnight is very much indicating that that is happening, so you've got quite alarming stuff: um, industrial output. Um, slowest growth rate since 2008 retail sales growth rate this is for these are November 2018 figures lowest annualized growth rate since 2003 um, GDP tracker now Bloomberg's GDP tracker down to 6.35 percent that's the weakest uh, for nearly three years and so on and so forth all of this data set overnight is just showing that this trade war risk is continuing to have a, an ever more negative effect. And if that trend continues, it doesn't matter what the principles are with negotiating. In the end, this economic decline will force Xi Jinping into making concessions, getting to the negotiating table and getting a deal done. I think Trump, it's similar but, but different. I think Trump, in the end, is governed by this thing. It's called the S&P 500. Um, I think he is all about the stock market. I, I honestly believe his policy decision making, certainly his tweet, act, Twitter activity, is very much driven by what's going on with the stock market. And that is one, one thing in the US is the US as a society, um, you have more US, a higher proportion of US citizens owning US shares than you do in any other country owning their domestic um, company shares. So, you know, he's very much in tune with, you know, popularity, winning votes. And ultimately, when your electorate owns shares and the share prices are tanking, then you've got a big problem, especially when ultimately it's his fault when you consider the trade war risk. It's his aggressive um, policy to try and alter that trade deficit. That is very responsible for this. So I think ultimately, the lower the S&P goes, the worse the economic data gets from China, the more likely you're going to get these two come together and actually do a deal and therefore avoid that hike in tariffs come 1st of April. Um, so it's kind of weird. You could say there's a bit of a safety net somewhere on the downside for the S&P because the lower it goes, the more likely a deal gets done. Uh, where that low is, I mean, certainly technically the obvious point to, to look at is the 2018 low setback start of February, just above the 2500 handle. So you know, on the downside, that's obviously a target. Um, so trade war risk, clearly. Um, then what do the Fed do? Mm. I don't um, know if you want to talk about Yeah, you've got, I, I think, under that circumstance, the trade war escalation and we do start moving lower not only do i agree with what trump would do but i think the fed what we'll hear from the fed next week is that yes they'll hike rates i don't think it's a one and done because i think as a fed strategy you want to have an incremental step stone down from yeah. being hawkish hmm. so whilst this equity market or fears might uh, get worse and that weigh on prices then not only definitely I think Trump will reverse attacked pretty pretty swiftly but I think the Fed will want to have this ability to go from two to one to one to none yeah I mean, why not in that in that sense and I think that's another reason why e any significant pullback in the US stock market I do think will have a pretty solid floor um, if it does get down to like you said that that Feb level yeah. I know you said the buy the dip is, um, I wouldn't want to be sat in a buy the dip trade, but I do think there'll be a pretty powerful coordinated almost, although that would never be vocalized response yeah. between the Fed and, and the administration. So the fiscal and the monetary, uh, or I say the foreign policy response. Yeah, um, I mean, I think with the Fed, I'm just showing the interest rate hiking cycle here. I think that's interesting what you said. I mean, in 20... So let's just ignore that one in 2015. In 2016, they hiked once. 2017, they hiked three times. 
2018, they're probably going to hike four times, of course, with the final one being next week. So it's like an acceleration. So are you saying now that they need to decelerate the hiking cycle? It's not like now we can start cutting. So it's almost like next year, will it be three or back to two hikes? Yeah, I, I think for well, two reasons. One, there isn't this... You know, everyone's already talking about the inversion of the yield curve, the recession coming, the late cycle, so on and so forth. This immediate, this was a this was a response to something which, okay, fine, the inversion was, I think, in what in 07? Yeah. it came before, but that this wasn't that just so happened in my point of view. I think this was a, an unknown thing. This was the black swan event that required immediate aggressive action. I think here it's all about, as a central banker, keeping some ammunition, some bullets on the table. And it's been such a hard graph for them to get off of here. They definitely don't want to, they want to keep this up as high as possible until absolute needs must. And then I think it starts to, because then you get a bit of bang for your buck on every time that, let's say, you you go from the sequence just getting more shallow to the point of then no change to the point of then cutting yeah. you're basically buying yourself time yeah. all the meanwhile you know you might be looking that statistically speaking the inversion I think of the twos tens to the recession taking place something like 765 days right now well, that's the average that's the yeah. average over the last few recessions and though I know there's obvious risks that could obviously... So recession end of 2020 then, is that what you're saying? Right, so at which point, let's say, okay, perfect storm. Well, not, not perfect if you're Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so then a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that could change then. Um, this kind of the, the policies and then the, the changing of political narrative. And yeah, so, so I've got a question for you then. I think there's a problem here because... I think you're right there from the Fed's point of view and their credibility perspective and in terms of ammunition for the next recession. You know, it's not like hike next week and then stop and right start to look to cut, you know, in 2019. Um, but of course, if the other factors, so let's say Europe, um, yeah. if the economic situation in Europe continues to deteriorate, which will have a knock-on negative effect on the emerging market space. And if the Fed, let's say they do hike next year, one, two times, whilst you're getting negative trends elsewhere, well then mm. that, isn't that gonna feed into m another episode of wave of dollar strength, which is then just gonna exacerbate the pressure on the emerging market space. It's almost like yep. that negative feedback loop it's well, hard to see how that doesn't happen. Well, like you said, the, if the Fed are going to hike again in 2019, it's got to happen sooner rather than later. So it's got to be yeah. March when right. the next dot plot comes out. That then is the meeting two weeks before the tariffs mm. then yep. expire. So can you pull the trigger at that point? Well, I mean, they're pulling the trigger right now, right? So. Mm. Um, of course they can. I, I guess it, it, we've then got to reassess three months down the line. What is the state, not just of the U.S.? Because one of the you know one of the things that the Bundesbank was saying this morning in Germany was that yes, Germany's slowing down. It's not our fault. It's Brexit. Right. So with the Fed, remember what what you said here. Remember in 2015 they said they were going to hike four times here. Yeah. They obviously did one, mm. and the main reasons were. Well, this almost sounds like a history repeating. It was yeah, China, absolutely. risks of China hard landing, and Brexit, well, the EU referendum, which yeah. wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah. And here we are again, a couple of years down the line. It's the same two real key risks, and then throw in an additional small issue of a trade war. Yeah. So, well, so actually, thinking timing-wise for 2019, then, the end of quarter one mm. is everything, because you've got yep. Brexit, yep. you've got the Fed potentially hiking, and then you've got the tariff um, deadline. And so they, they are three kind of major risk, global risks, right? And they're all coming together. So I think actually what happens to, let's say, the S&P or any global market for that matter? What happens to these markets in 2019? Now, what are year-end targets? Well, I think ultimately what happens by the end of quarter one will determine whether we hit the kind of square 
down here where we're breaking lower. This sell-off in October, November is just the beginning. You know, if we get down there, you know, you're going to, to get down there, you're going to need, again, a breakdown in talks with China. So that tariff hike looms. Um, you're going to have to see a carnage in Westminster, ultimately. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to know what happens. But by the end of January, what is it, 21st, 22nd of January, is the proposed 21st. kind of final, yeah. final date for Parliament to to vote through any kind of deal and, and let's say that doesn't happen and I have to say it's hard to see how that is going to happen at this point but given what happened last night in Brussels uh, Europe just not interested in um, having any kind of um, legal obligation to end the Irish backstop then it's hard to see how this deal can uh, be altered for it to be voted through Parliament so um, yeah, I'd say by the end of quarter one, you're going to, we'll know. Um, and it could be the top, of course. It could be that a deal gets done with China, happy days. Um, it could be that the Fed do hike in March because the economy's strong enough, but with a dovish tilt saying, look, we are hiking, but we're near the top. Um, and let's say somehow miraculously Brexit, oh, well, who knows, referendum, no Brexit, then that could have you know quite a positive impact on Europe more, more broadly so I think by the end of quarter one we're going to know where we're going to go so 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 what can we cancel Christmas and just move on because January start right now just, just, sounds yeah yeah I mean for certainly what my role is here at amplified then I can't wait <laughs> because um, obviously I don't want to be the the bearer of bad news but like Pierre said equally it could be quite positive but what the point is here is you've got to understand the news and all the macro factors it's really now is more important than ever um, in addition to the kind of technical setups that really understanding these these are key drivers going forward so well look let's push the conversation on we've talked about the S&P talked about the Fed and stocks quite a lot and Trump let's talk let's move let's get the pound chart up yeah and let's just talk, we've got to talk Brexit. Um, I guess rather than get stuck into the, the nitty gritty, you've kind of given a, a good snapshot of what happened last night. Uh, I guess the bigger picture is, you know, where do we go from here? You mentioned 21st of Jan, that's the self-imposed deadline from, from Theresa May. So definitely, I mean, I've always been saying in regular briefings that I think this the fate of Brexit really is contingent on what happens over the coming weeks uh, it's yeah. going to define whether whether we break 120 or whether we <clears throat> commence then I think if we can move into a smooth transition period and I do firmly believe that a transition will lead to a transition and so, so on hang, so hang on but so, let me go on but the, the, the thing that you'd have I was talking to one of the guys here is that if you were labor rather than striking now would it be more opportune to go into transition wait till 2020 when economically then if we are having this at this downturn you then basically probably will get to a point where not a lot has changed we're yeah. two years further down the line we have the exact repeat of now but in 2020 mm -hmm. the only difference is then the economy if it does go into timed recession when people households who are already under pressure then are really feeling physical pain then is that a better time then for for opposition party to strike so you're Should you're, we you're assuming we we make it into right. the transition period then? on those on that discussion point yes okay so how does that uh, first question before we talk about the yeah. transition period how does that happen so because right right now yeah. um theresa may's got a deal okay that is spectacularly unpopular okay, yeah to the point where she couldn't even bring it to the vote okay so she's gone back to europe to try and get some concessions around obviously particularly the irish backstop okay yeah. and first attempt that's failed Right, so she now comes back. Mm -hmm. um, so there's going to be another EU summit, or well, there have to be now, early January, early to mid January, before the 21st of January. Um, 
what's going to change in the next four weeks for Europe to give some concessions or yep. do you think that staring into the abyss on the 21st of January the deal is the same do you think MPs will change their minds right. in Westminster so the latter I actually think that the problem that you've got with this negotiation or what you have had is there's even though you've been backed into a corner there's always been a little place to wiggle out to go well there's still a little bit more time there's still another week or another day but I think the problem that you have is that article 50 in a sense can also be extended yeah so this this is where <clears throat> you're going to get this brinksmanship now Europe will be resolute that that's not the case right you, Europe will say what they said last night and if I was Europe I would have said exactly the same to Theresa May last night knowing that we've got another four weeks to basically show her but also everyone else in Europe that you know, this is not you know, we are not flexible to someone's demands upon leaving Europe and so on because of their own agenda or unity to protect. All the, more, all the meantime, European economic conditions are deteriorating. Yeah. What I need for my view to play out is I need these yellow vests, um, for example, in France protests, which are happening again, despite Macron's efforts across the nation this weekend. I need, a, I need that to continue. I need the PMI data we saw this morning to continue to soften. Yeah. And obviously, we, we haven't got a lot of time for statistical data to come out. But these guys you know, will know what the, what the sense is economically on the ground. And, and does that almost then force them in on the European side? Because I'm not just looking at the domestic side here. The Europeans have also got to basically give a con major concession. Yeah. Um, but then on the, on the, the MP side in in Britain, I, I just think that, I mean, you vote against the deal, you're then risking then Europe having to agree to the extension of Article 50. And then at that point, that's the only alternate then I can see this falling apart and we go down the route of the second well, referendum the, side. The only way I think Europe will agree to extend Article 50 is if there's a general election or there's another referendum. And then they'll say, all right, fine, let's pause, let's delay that deadline to see what happens. Will Europe extend Article 50 just because the UK still aren't happy with the deal and want more time to negotiate? I, I actually think Europe will not, will not, there'll not be a consensus in the EU 27 to extend Article 50 just to allow more time for the UK to negotiate when really they don't want to negotiate any further. Mm. Will Westminster therefore vote through the bill on the 21st of January if it's or will 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 Europe give concessions on the backstop? Will if not will MPs in Westminster vote through Theresa May's bill? I I don't I I, I honestly think for the first for the first I'm moving now more towards the idea that we're either going no Brexit, oh sorry, no deal, I should say, we're either going no deal, or it might get to the point where Conservative MPs are so, 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 so desperate, that's the, the Remainers are so desperate that they team up with Labour <sighs> to vote this bill down and trigger some kind of election event or some kind of referendum event. I, I think the the views in the Conservative Party are so entrenched. So could could you? I not think looking into the abyss doesn't matter. Yeah. Could you not then, rather than risk uh, a general election, which obviously carries then, not that this is, would happen according to the polls. Obviously, Labour's not nowhere near an outright winner in that situation. Yeah. But could Theresa May not then create some kind of deal internally to say? Okay, I said I was going to resign at this date. I'll resign a lot sooner. You back this through, get this in, or you know the cabinet changes. She changes her timelines of her leadership. Yeah. Some, you know, she's already like we were saying the other day. They were asking. Well, she's here right yeah. now, Teresa. You were saying only a few weeks ago, and for many months actually, that 
any time anyone asks you a question about your leadership, you're just swerving them, no comment. Now you're saying, uh, what was the date she said she was going to step down? Before the next election. Before, Before the next election, which is May 2022. So she's already, it seems, to get the, uh, to, to survive the no confidence, she's had some backdoor conversations, I'm sure, with the 1922 committee members and so on and so forth, the ERG. So could she use that as a leverage to appease them without them running the risk of then, I mean, teaming up with, not, not teaming up with Labour, absolutely, teaming up with Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> that's a whole nother level <laughs> for these guys. And as anti-Euro skeptic they might be, I mean, we've not even talked about the political policies here and, and working um, in that fashion. So well, look, well, let, let's move yeah. this on and talk about the chart. And right. well, let's say, let's say your view comes through first so between now and then, obviously things politically are going to deteriorate, which means the price fundamentally should continue to move lower. Yeah, I think so. The break of the summer low um, this week obviously has been key and down to test the 125 handle and move. Uh, make that a bit small. You keep talking. Uh, down, down through, well, down to test the 125 handle, which has so far survived, but it definitely that's technically massive that break of the summer low and i think if you are just looking technically only forget about all the various well almost impossible um uh, different outcomes that might happen politically technically we're now going to test 120. you know that that key break of the summer low i think is very significant and um, the 120 handles coming and i think you know, even if a, I don't know how it would happen, but even if a deal gets done and what have you, I think in the next few weeks, you know, we're going to see the uh, sentiment around Brexit continue to stay negative, if not get even more negative. And I think that that almost guarantees more downside for sterling. And I would be fantastically surprised if the 120 handle is now not tested. And um, when we get there, I don't know. Um, but before the 21st of January, yeah, it's going to and be then I think right. I think then what happens around the that that mid to end of January then will determine whether 120 again's a great bottom and we bounce or a break of 120. Okay, so yeah, no deal, mm. break 120. Yeah, where do we go? Um, <clears throat> well, here I think you need to look on a super long term. I mean, when were we like? It's actually, there's no point. It's like it's like a 30 year low, isn't it? Can I go to a yearly chart here? Okay, we've only got data going back to 2001. Um, we haven't been through 120 for all of that time. You know, you're talking 35, 36 year lows down here. Um, so how far do we go below 120? Well, we'll potentially, I don't know. Well, well, I guess, I mean, what I can say is that the bank reports that I have read, yeah. quite a few are tabling 110. Yeah, so I mean, I think when you get when you get through prices that you haven't seen for decades, then the big handles become the targets. It's not a surprise that the 2016 and 2017 low is at 120. So inevitably, you're looking 115 or 110. Mm. Everyone, if you break 120, it's 115 or 110. Yeah, um, for sure. And so those big handles will be the targets so yeah i mean i think certainly i think more downside for the pound into year end technically this looks quite nice for the trend to continue whether we get to 120 before christmas i think probably not that's asking a bit too much unless something major well i guess you're going to need some more negative developments of course it's possible um, so then if uh, let's talk the the complete opposite yeah Smooth passage into transition phase, um, secured by then um, end of March. So yeah. the kind of the pressure cooker, if you like, is the tension alleviated substantially mm. um, for at least a, a period of time. Let's assume that Theresa May is, is still there at this point. Hasn't, yeah. not, no deals, backdoor deals or anything. So if we saw a meaningful recovery here, do we see one? And yeah. if so, where to? So I think people, I, I think the ability for sterling to appreciate against the dollar, even with a move into the transition period, I think uh, is limited. 
you know, I think ultimately, if you now just talk economically and look at the European um, situation, um, I'm going to talk Europe and the UK here because like data this morning, for example, um, from Europe was particularly worrying. Um, when you look at charts, actually, I'm going to show you, um, sorry, one second. I'm going to show you the French data here this morning. Um, here's the French services PMI for November. Okay. Oh, sorry, December, flash estimate, big sharp drop. Now, how much of that is due to the Yellow Vest Brigade? We don't know. We're going to need to see January's figures, really. But certainly this is, and this is below 50 now. So French PM, services PMI below 50, that's contractionary territory. Um, check out the, well, let's go to German manufacturing PMIs. And, you know, here you're seeing a continuation of this downtrend. And... You know, this is very worrying. And when you look at German GDP, well, for quarter three, it's negative, right? So mm. we've definitely got, whether it, how much of it is Brexit related when you're looking at Germany, it's hard to know, but you've definitely got a downward trending economic conditions in Europe, okay? Now, clearly the UK is, is the same, you know, and this is more for Brexit reasons. Um, if we look at UK GDP, all right, we've had a little bit of a rebound here, but um, I think this is when we went through the summer when you got stuff like the World Cup going on and you've got actually some positive developments on Brexit and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, I think if we go into transition, I guess the point I want to make is if we go into transition, then don't we still have the uncertainty that we've, we've been living with for the last two years? It, it, the uncertainty still is, well, what's the trade deal going to be? And this to the the uncertainty lives on um plus then at the same time underlying everything have we had europe reach the peak of the economic cycle you know yes brexit is playing a role there but actually is it bigger than just brexit and is it that that we're actually in an economic we've peaked and then we're going to see the economic conditions deteriorate and if so what i'm mostly worried about for europe if and, and a hard Brexit can just accelerate this, but even with a move into transition period, I think underlying economic conditions are weakening. And the big problem, of course, if we move to a recession, let's say end of 2019, well, one way of dealing with a recession is monetary stimulus. And unfortunately, the ECB's ammunition box here is absolutely empty and they're literally just ending QE, right? They want to get away from this, this mm. permanent addiction to monetary stimulus and they want to get back to normal. But it could be they turn off the QE tap and actually we're still so dependent on it that these economic conditions slide. And what do they do? Do they start restart QE? <laughs> I just don't yeah. think it's an option. Draghi got asked this yesterday. One of the journalists asked a really interesting question and he asked that, you know, what would happen if we have a continuation of the downturn? You know, are you concerned that traditional monetary policy tools have been exhausted? And you know, what would you do? What are the alternatives? And Draghi said, no, I'm not concerned. Traditional monetary tools have not been exhausted. And I'm like, this, what? Th this was the, uh, you know, just at that point, this was a classic phrase he made. I, I had to tweet it at the time. Uh, yeah. Continuing confidence with increasing caution. Yeah, I love it. That's him, his way of trying to describe, trying to say yes. We obviously the data is showing that we're downtrending, and and if you look just at this, you know, here are their economic projections. So mm. they have to acknowledge the fact that we've got a slowing economic situation. But of course, he doesn't want to say we're really worried about it. Yeah because then that obviously feeds through into the sentiment and then we'll just drive an ever more accelerated move lower. So I just think one of the big risks for 2019 is Europe. Um, not necessarily Brexit. Brexit can exacerbate it, but I just think Europe now become the the, the, the sick man of the world as it is. And so, and, and so I'm worried that they're the region that have got the least ability right. to deal with it. Because can I just say one more point before you come in? <laughs> There's two ways to deal with a recession. Yeah. Monetary stimulus. Well, they haven't got any. The other way is fiscal. Fiscal stimulus. Now, 
Are you telling me that Europe can now fiscally stimulate, <laughs> given what's been going on with Italy over the last few months, who are trying to fiscally stimulate, and right. Europe are like, no, you're not allowed to do that. And what, are they now going to flip and say, actually, yeah, let's go for it? That would be, I, I think, relationships amongst the European leaders would be quite significantly damaged. Yeah, yeah, no, no I was just going to really <laughs> add further fuel to your your points, which is not even discussed. Italy is unresolved. Merkel is leaving. Right. France is literally in flames. It's kind of, it's almost like you said, a, a perfect storm of, of you know, the outside of the economics, which is a pretty compelling case, is politically. I don't think Europe's, it hasn't been stretched so much as it is now. Uh, it's almost on all fronts, um, the, the kind of European ideology is being severely tested. This is the stress test to the maximum. Um, but it's going to be interesting. I mean, does an ec is, an, is a sizable economic downturn actually what brings European nations back together? Oof. I don't know. Or it could drive them further apart. Depends Look, how bad the downturn. Here's the DAX, and we talk about the S and P back to the, you know back to flat for the year or just negative. But look, the DAX here is, you know, that's um, if I just get my pointer tool, we're back to quite a key sort of area which we've broken, and this was the kind of set of resistances that we had um, through quarter three and quarter four of 2016. Now that we broke and, and then drove higher. And these are, we haven't seen these prices since for two years. This is a two-year low for the DAX. Now, very, you know, we often talk about the S and P, and uh, in some ways, Brexit and trade war. In some ways, is a bit of a distraction. That's the media are so heavily focused on that. Mm. It's almost like just subtly underneath that, actually, Europe's Europe's turned over here. And I think, I, for me, Europe is. Yes, US and China trade war, fine. But I actually think Europe is an undervalued risk. Um, so Colin's asking who has the highest debt per capita um, in Europe? And of course it is Italy. Um, Italy, and this is why Europe is so anti-Italy fiscally stimulating, is because they're worried that they're, they're, they're too indebted to to attempt that kind of policy because if it doesn't work, if fiscal stimulus fails, if it doesn't kickstart an acceleration in economic activity, well then all you're left with is just more debt. And Italy, unfortunately, have already got too much. Um, yeah, Ireland as well, Colin's adding in. I mean, certainly Ireland are in a similar situation. I guess we're still, and if you look at debt to GDP levels, let's just say broadly, um, I'll, I'll pick on Italy, but um, yeah, we're still at the top. If I if I show you on a ten year, no, let me show you maximum. Look, we're still at the top. We're still. Not only have we not recovered from the fiscal stimulus that was required after the crisis ten years ago, not only have we not recovered, we haven't even started to recover. So it's still, actually, right out at its worst. So fiscally. There's not much stimulus left to use. Monetary policy-wise, there isn't much stimulus left to use. So I, you know, I'm just a bit, for me, Europe's a, an underrated risk. Outside of Brexit, it's just a, I think people sh should have this as a higher risk on their radar. Right, so to, to throw into that equation then, there's all, obviously this as well, which is mm. Draghi's term comes to an end. Now, does that have a... Um, a meaningful impact then on the response nature what? of central banks. Well, what do you think? Who's going to who's going to replace Draghi? Because Draghi got asked. Oh no, he didn't. He got asked who was going to be vice president. Yeah, go on. Who's who's replacing Draghi? What nationality? <laughs> well, be? This is a this is the big question because obviously the Germans very much would like to l line themselves up, and if you actually you look at the course of 2018. Obviously, everyone knows that the central bankers serve a term, and, and Weidmann's language actually has quite radically changed yeah. in order to come off the fringe of being a, an associated outright hawk. If he's going to govern the ECB, he obviously needs to become more centrist. Has he become that? Well, not quite, but... Um, Is he becoming more 
less hawkish just to get the job, and then he'll revert to type. Right, that's I guess a possible risk, but would I mean I guess I'd need to check, but the it needs to be agreed and voted upon, and who who gets to say who takes the 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 helm, the president role, and I'd imagine that there'll be a lot of countries who'd be very unhappy with a German-led central bank. Um, so whether he, in fact, or someone a little bit more already middle ground, I'd say is probably more suitable. I don't, and again, we've not really looked at this a great deal at this point, um, but this will definitely be a talking it's point. definitely a risk. Starting beginning of next year, because this is so crucial then for how ECB could respond if we are, in fact, going into this downturn. Yeah. You know, the mechanisms of the QE restarting, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know about whether this is a shoe in for Germany. I think actually it's f far from the case. Uh, but that's another thing just so what, to be aware of. What else on this, let's on talk, this let's, chart let's, are you... Um, let's talk oil prices because okay, I get a yeah. lot of questions about this. Let's get the oil chart up. Let's have a look at, um, you know, obviously we've seen this spectacular reversal of price from excess of 75 down to 50, we kind of stabilized. Um, now the OPEC of OPEC plus in this agreement of a 1.2 million cut. Um, you know, where do we go from here? The price point here, technically, you can see there is 50 is just psychologically such a such a, an important marker. But not only that, we know we've talked about it before. The the North American shale industry and the pressures that that would come under and could that backfire on Trump looking to deliver his tax cuts to the middle class if the price went too low well he's gonna that that 50 year low in US unemployment is gonna change pretty quick when these these refiners or, or the, the shale industry start laying off people as as sites start to close down and and they can't meet their debt obligations in that respect so I guess the question is then going forward uh, on the chart here the next OPEC meeting is in April so on the right hand side um, so we've already had the agreement at the moment and my kind of belief is that the OPEC meeting in April uh, I'm not sure whether that the April it's one is probably one of the technical yeah. meetings that they hold to see whether everyone's adhering to the agreement normally these are semi-annual uh, in Vienna at their headquarters but I mean what did they agree a six month cut so yeah was timeline it is rolling yeah I'm not sure the, the definitive I can't remember to, to hand but um, my view on that was that the cut well this is two things here one is a cut of 1.2 million I don't think is um, necessarily enough because we talked about this you know, Russia, American, you know, America pumping at north of 11 and a half million. It's just incredible the rise that that's been on. But going through all the other OPEC based nations, nearly everyone's been you know, trying to pump at a maximum level uh, whilst they can, so particularly those that have fiscally struggled like Libya or, or other countries. That then in the backdrop of a questionable global economic growth story mm -hmm. I think is quite quite worrying um, but is the fifth is where we are now is the consolidation at 50 the reality of pricing in for all of that risk yeah and is 50 now the floor right and 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 or do we go lower um, or do you think I think I you know I think ultimately you know, up in the 70s was too high we, you know we were we got overbought I and mean, it's amazing to think back you know you go back to the September and people are people are like genuinely saying right hundred dollars oil here yeah um, so we definitely got overbought so for sure 70 to 80 was too much um, Yes, they've cut by 1.2 million barrels per day, um, which is not an insignificant amount, but I know people were hoping for a 1.4 million barrel a day cut. Um, but I think, do we go lower or do we go back higher? I think now it's less of a supply side 
force and now it's more about that demand side so um, it depends on the economic trajectory of the world as you go through quarter one quarter two of 2019 I think for now though I think 50 is a good floor it could break down to $42 at some point next year but only on the situation where the US trade war risk with China gets worse and we see a hike in tariffs you know if this whole Europe you know Brexit but also more broadly European economic slowdown continues then fine the demand side weakness can lead to a break lower I think in the meantime the supply side shock I think we're kind of priced in here and I think 50 to 55 dollars may well turn out to be the sort of price range until we know further about the economic reality. So, so picking up on one of your points when you talked about the S&P, could crude actually be a bit of an indicator for Trump's I mean, the kind of narrative that he puts forward on the trade front? So when you're trying to judge then that point of when does, if he softens, should it materially get worse? Well, if oil starts coming down, breaks that level substantially, like you said, technically then opens up some clean air and you run lower and we go to 42, which then starts to impact North American firms. Yeah. He knows that the demand part that's weighing on this is that of, you know, I guess that, you know, there could be adjustments on US production equally, as well as putting the pressure on Saudis again to do more and things like that to force it back up. But could, as an equity trader, mm -hmm. this is quite pivotal then as a, yeah. as a asset to look at. I think Trump's certainly a, obviously a big part of this sell-off. I think Trump's happy now. Mm. You know, here at early 50s, I think he's done, he feels like he's done his job. He's got oil significantly lower. I think you're right. Below 50, I think for Trump, it then turns into a negative um, from that shale industry point of view. And so actually, uh, I think Trump has kind of I expect him to now kind of step out of the conversation here now that he feels like he's done what he set out to and because of the OPEC cut all right not as big as some were hoping mm. I think I think we do stabilize here the reason why I say that I'm not saying we're going to rebound 55 bucks maybe but the reason why I say that is because we've had so many opportunities to break 50 mm. in the last couple of weeks some really big kind of news events you know on the supply side but uh, and, and, and we just haven't broken 50 each time mm. you know if you look on the daily chart each time we flirted with that 50 handle you know it has been um, solid now however we are going to need to see this this trend of course I mean it depends how you draw it but this trend line which is phenomenally steep I don't know where you draw it but you know, are we getting a break of the trend? You know, technically, is this looking now like more evidence that we are at a floor for now? I think potentially. So, I mean, I, I, so I'm neutral yep. in the 50 to 55 bracket. And I think the economics of it all. But don't also don't forget that any kind of supply shock, yeah, black yeah. swan this supply shock event. Absolutely. Um, is potential that could take things back higher but yeah I mean that's absolutely a point I think that's underplayed yeah big time you know let's not forget the situation politically that's that's unfolded in Saudi Arabia the last couple yeah. of weeks the uh, sanctions on Iran you know the whole interesting thing on that geopolitical side is the obviously the sanctions on Iran with the exemptions that people like China can continue buying Iranian yeah. crude uh, and what is interesting is you're in a trade war with China obviously but then China's buying all the Iranian crude who then Iran's aligned with Russia and it's just you know, it's a fascinating time on, on, on that front because you've not even got into Putin no, well. and, and, and the Russia risk which I guess is a, a discussion for another another time but one question there just to finish on the oil front so Tim was asking um, Saudi's cutting back exports to the US so on and so forth uh, are we looking at a world where WTI is less relevant? And I guess that brings about the question of, is, it, has OPEC, because I had this question, I think a couple of days ago from one of our kind of junior traders was, is OPEC done? Uh, um, is there, it, do they really have now the clout? Does the group really have the ability to really influence prices? 
OPEC are done. Um, that's why you now have OPEC plus. Right. So it was very telling that the week of the OPEC meeting, the OPEC meeting itself was a complete waste of time, non-event, couldn't agree on anything. OPEC plus get Russia to the table, then a deal can be done. So it now has to be, versus the US supplies is so huge now that OPEC on their own have no real major influence on global pricing. So it has to be OPEC and Russia that together have enough of global supply to be in control of price. Now, on the WTI side, yeah, sure, WTI is becoming less relevant, and that's because the US are now becoming closer and closer and closer to, to being self-sufficient, you know, with, with their crude production up at 11.7 million barrels a day. Now, I'm all right, their demand is more than that, but, you know, they're able to buy their oil. Anything they are importing, you know, can come from Canada and, and, and Brazil or what have you. You know, the, the whole idea of the U.S. being dependent on Middle Eastern oil is done. So, so, so where does that leave Saudi Arabia? So I think Saudi instance? Arabia are vulnerable. Um, and that's why the Khashoggi event was so dangerous for Saudi Arabia. Um, I think for now, because Trump is in office... And Trump loves selling weapons. Uh, Saudi still have that. Uh, you know, they're still buying a lot of U.S. weapons, obviously for for the war in the Yemen. Um, but I think, yeah, Saudi have, are going to probably become increasingly more isolated and vulnerable in the Middle East as they lose their um, big brother, um, who's yeah. who's got their back. So I think that can lead to, unfortunately, probably. In the, I'm talking five years, in the next five years, maybe an escalation in the instability in the Middle East. And of course, from a supply side point of view, you know, that could be quite dramatic. I mean, that's not, that's not near term though, but. Um. Okay, and then just on that energy point, there was, um, had a question on that original graphic as to natural gas, which you can see here, number two, a 34% rise uh, year to date, so obviously a, a phenomenal move higher. And I just saw some good graphics here on the FT, because I know it's not something that a lot of you might traditionally look at, but just wanted to explain very briefly why that's happened. So this was an article back in November, and on that one day in November, um, you know, so if you don't look at this asset regularly, it rose 18% on a day the biggest one day gain in eight years and, and and this kind of sums it up onset of winter tests the ability of shale production to supply the country and essentially if you look back down at this graphic what's happened is in you know we certainly experienced this in britain an incredibly hot summer uh, same case in in north america and that essentially means then in the country where typical homes will have air conditioning units and demand spikes and so you draw down on your stockpiles and we go into what's called a, an injection season where we look to rebuild our stocks but the problem is as you can see there on the right hand side about 3.2 trillion cubic feet in storage which is actually a more than decade low so if then as it is expected to be this winter is going to be incredibly cold well, then demand's going to spike again, but you've got even less in supply. And so, you know, things are looking, this is when you get that re substantial and immediate repricing of this new kind of expectation. So I guess if you were looking at this, then, you know, tracking of weather conditions, as is always the case with nat gas, is going to be uh, very influential. But, okay, otherwise... Um, can, we, can I just finish yep. on one point? Last, last point. It's... Um, Looking back at this graphic, down at the bottom end, you're getting your sort of the coppers, you know, that kind of in industrial slowdown in China scenario. Um, soya bean is kind of part of the trade war. Or basically European stocks down here, which, as I said, is just subtly kind of gone under the radar a little bit, just how bad a year it's been for European equity pricing. Mm. Um, but one thing that's not on this list, there should be a bar that extends out to 82.5% down. Um, can anybody tell me 
what I might be referring to here, there is a market that's 82.5% lower on the year. And the answer to that question is Bitcoin. So here we go. So just as a, just as a, I mean, this isn't the reason why it's not on our on our graphic here is because really it's not a proper market. <sighs> well, you're going to get a lot of. I know you're going to get a lot of hate online for that comment. There, sorry, Piers. but it's not a mainstream financial asset. Right. Okay, that's acceptable. Right. Let's move on. <laughs> so, so uh, 80, 82 and a half percent slide from twenty thousand, and slide from 20,000 and you know, certainly technically today, just be aware, well, so I think 3,000 is going to get tested. How far does this go down? Right, go back. Uh, I suppose we, we, you'll need the actual Bitcoin chart. I was looking yeah. at this actually, and at, like what you said with the S&P, um, or some of the other instruments when you or the pound it was when we break a such a long yeah. time time frame technical support right. actually it starts to become as was the rise totally driven by human behavior and I think even technically you see that reflected on the, the creep up in prices from when Bitcoin was trading 950 yeah. it got to 950 yeah. hit a barrier then went to 1500 then it yeah. went to three yeah. so actually I think 3000 1500 and, and then 950 is kind of just literally the handles going down. Is yeah. well, 6,000 was such ones. an important yeah. I mean, floor all year yeah. until we've broken. And as soon as that gets broken, it's 5,000, it's 4,000, it's 3,000, it's 2,000, 1,000. <laughs> well, this, I mean, this is it. 100. You, I cannot answer that question because I've got no way to value this asset. So. Right. Yeah. Goes back to okay, okay, so um, that's it, guys. We'll wrap it up there. Uh, hopefully, that was useful. I know there was a couple of people putting um, a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm, I'm sure uh, peers can can pick those up after lunch. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much for for joining us. So, um, any questions you do have, then this is going to go up on YouTube. Feel free to leave a comment, uh, and we can respond over the coming days. Uh, if any questions, all right. Thanks very much. Have a great Christmas and a happy new year. Thanks, guys.